Diamonds. Timeless. Beautiful. Symbols of love. They are the world's most precious and sought after gems. In today's market, a stone like this is probably a $15 million diamond. But in Africa during the 1990s, these beautiful stones became blood diamonds, named not for their color, but for their cost in human conflict and suffering. Literally millions of people have lost their lives as a result of blood diamonds. They put us together and ordered our arms chopped off. You hear people crying, rebels attacking them, women being brutalized, people being shot at. Children were kidnapped and turned into killers. She staggered back and we entered the house. I took the woman's baby from the house. She later died and I felt so sorry for that baby. When the story broke, a global industry would come under fire. They feared that diamonds would become the new fur, that people would boycott diamonds, they were the most politically incorrect jewelry you could think of. This is the true story of blood diamonds. In 2007, the Leonardo DiCaprio movie Blood Diamond revealed the dark side of the world's most sought-after gem. The film is set in Sierra Leone, one of the poorest nations on Earth. The average income of its people is little more than a hundred pounds a year. Yet beneath its soil lies a treasure trove of diamonds. Sierra Leonean diamonds are legendary uh, for their value and, uh, and their beauty. It's the size, the color, uh, the refractive nature of, of the stone, all those qualities that the, the diamond specialists know and love. Diamonds should have made Sierra Leone a paradise. Instead, they've made it a hell. From 1991 to 2001, a brutal war raged between the government and a rebel group called the RUF, the Revolutionary United Front, a war funded in part by diamonds. They said they were fighting for democracy, but they fought against civilians, and they used diamonds to fuel the whole thing. They used diamonds to get the guns to fight the war. The country and its people still bear the scars of 10 years of diamond-fueled warfare. A very day, where they chopped me to hand. That very day when they chopped my hands off, I didn't expect to leave. I didn't believe I would be able to sit down and talk to you as I do now. I knew I was finished. During the war, Ibrahim Fofana worked in one of the many mines in eastern Sierra Leone, pulling rough diamonds from the ground. In April 1998, the RUF attacked his village. The rebel there, oh, inside the town. When they came to town, they were in full combat uniform. They had weapons, RPGs. Rebels confronted his neighbor. Now they didn't know that soldiers say that one of the soldiers asked him for diamonds and he told him he had no diamonds. After me out to the next house, the soldier followed him out, shot and killed him. A different fate awaited Ibrahim. I do all can cry a hala. I yelled and screamed. The rebels were laughing at me. They told me to stretch my arms out, but I said that was not going to happen. They used their guns and hit me all over my body, and that weakened me. This hand 
They laid it out on the mortar and chopped it off. They laid the other one out and chopped it off too. In Sierra Leone, more than 10,000 people suffered a similar fate. Amputation became the trademark atrocity of the RUF. They committed every war crime in the Geneva Conventions and then invented one of their own. Intentional mutilation of non-combatant civilians. And the whole purpose of it was to serve a military strategy to induce population flow away from the areas that, that the RUF wanted under its control. And of course that was just the diamond mines. As the people of Sierra Leone suffered the horrors of civil war, diamonds mined illegally by the rebels flowed freely into the world diamond market. Our estimates are that 10 to 15 percent, possibly even higher, of the world diamond trade was blood diamonds. Blood diamonds, mined in the 1990s, still grace the hands and necks of unsuspecting customers all over the world. A conflict diamond doesn't come with a little tag on it that says conflict diamond. I am from a war zone. It doesn't have a little sort of like, like skull and crossbones nicked in the side. The modern story of how diamonds are brought to the market is bound up with one company that took a stone and transformed it into a multi-billion pound industry. In Sierra Leone in the 1990s, RUF rebels used revenue from diamonds to fund a brutal civil war. So I've been there as I picked this guava. Now I see I was picking guava from a tree when I saw them. Some wearing red, some had red ribbons. Ten of them. They asked me why I was frightened. They literally fell on me and sexually assaulted me. RUF soldiers gave themselves gruesome nicknames, such as Bloodmaster, Wicked to Women, and The Killer. They don't go around the village and don't capture some of you. They surrounded the village and captured about 55 of us. They put us together and then called upon a boy known as The Killer. They decided to sacrifice someone. They brought a lady from the Limba ethnic group and she was killed. Diamonds also funded two other brutal civil wars in Africa during the 1990s, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo and Angola. And it was in Angola that the horrors of blood diamonds first came to the world's attention. It's got everything, offshore oil, it's got diamonds, it has all kinds of resources, and it's just a sad, dismal tale of human greed and of, of the most revolting conditions of exploitation. From the mid-70s to the mid-90s, a bitter civil war had raged between government troops and rebel forces, known as UNITA. While the government relied on Angola's oil revenues, the rebels turned to diamonds. At the beginning of the 90s, they needed money for arms, and so they strategically decided to take over the diamond mines in northern Angola. By 1992, the rebels controlled nearly 70% of Angola's diamond mines. The war was funded in one part by the sale of diamonds extracted by people, often in conditions of enslavement. And they had little trouble finding buyers for their illicit stones. UNITA had a very sophisticated sales system in place. Diamond dealers from all over the diamond dealing world would come to UNITA. They would even form joint mining partnerships. Those diamonds went straight into the market in Antwerp and they got an enormous amount of money for them. $3.7 billion worth of diamonds from Angola went through UNITA's hands during the 1990s. Often, deals were done without cash, even changing hands. Arms dealers would fly in and would 
directly negotiate arms for diamonds. They would bring their diamond evaluator with them and there would be no cash. This would simply a diamond for arms transaction. Somebody would fly a tank down to Angola in a Russian IL-76 and land it on a little bush strip that couldn't be picked up by satellite at night. Down goes the back, up into the light goes a guy with a sack of diamonds. Some little guy sits down with a table, paws through the sample, decides what they're worth, off goes the tank. Illegal diamond revenue sustained Unita's vicious war machine. For the people of Angola, the horror seemed to have no end. Close to a million people lost their lives in the conflict in Angola unnecessarily. The war sparked an investigation by Global Witness, a small London-based pressure group focusing on human rights abuses and environmental issues. Angolan diamonds are some of the best diamonds in the world. 80% of Angola's diamonds are gem quality. These are the diamonds that everybody wants. And that was one of the main problems uh, for Angola and uh, one of the, the blessings for UNITA. In 1998, Global Witness published an expose on conflict diamonds entitled A Rough Trade. The reaction that Global Witness received from the publication of our report in 98 was explosive. Nobody understood what was really happening, the impact of these diamonds being sold so openly, so easily, in exchange for millions of dollars. Really for us it was horrific that consumers were basically funding the war in Angola and we felt that was unacceptable. What Global Witness did was to expose this, uh, this diamond ring, this act of love in the West, as being intrinsically linked to a bloody conflict somewhere in Africa. In fact, far from expressing love, it's actually joined up to a chain of commercial transactions that started with someone getting killed or maimed through an act of war. The report's greatest criticism was leveled at industry giant. De Beers. De Beers had dominated the market in African diamonds for a hundred years. Their philosophy was simple. Control diamond supply and you control prices. We have an idea that diamonds are rare, but they're not. What created the value in diamonds is withholding the supply, making sure that the supply is regulated and, 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 and there's never a flood of diamonds on the market. That's one thing that De Beers did right from the beginning. With supply under their control, De Beers, under the inspired leadership of their chairman, Ernest Oppenheimer, launched a brilliant ad campaign in 1948, designed to increase demand. His genius was in coming up with the advertising campaign that made a diamond synonymous with human love and in particular the right of marriage and engagement because he rightly concluded that he could get people to pay quite a bit to buy a diamond in order to pledge their love. But the blood diamond scandal that Global Witness unleashed threatened the De Beers business as never before. De Beers was very prominent in buying Angolan diamonds and also diamonds that came from UNITA. From 1992 to 1997, in every annual report, they talked about their outside buying power, how strong they were on the market to buy up these diamonds that were flooding onto the market that would have threatened the price stability of the diamond trade. De Beers defends its purchase of Angolan diamonds. Well, first of all, De Beers, to make it absolutely clear, has never bought conflict diamonds. During the 90s, we were working in partnership with the official government in Luanda, purchasing diamonds, exporting, paying revenues, etc. They dispute the idea that blood or conflict diamonds even existed before 1998. Up until the point of, of sanctions being imposed, there was by definition no conflict diamonds in that country. The diamond industry likes to think that conflict diamonds only started in 1999, when in fact it was going on way before that. When it was recognized that the rebels in Angola were no longer going to participate in any significant way in building peace in that country, the United Nations imposed sanctions and De Beers immediately, swiftly and effectively started working with the United Nations to ensure that those sanctions were fully implemented. 
In October 1999, De Beers took decisive action and announced the closure of their Angolan offices. But the Blood Diamond story wasn't over. 2,000 miles away, the war in Sierra Leone stood on the verge of new horrors. Diamonds had played a central part in Sierra Leone's history for centuries. Under British rule, and for the first few years after independence, diamonds had brought prosperity to this tiny nation. When Sierra Leone got independence in 1961, the prospects looked pretty good. It had a fairly good infrastructure. There was a railroad, there was a network of highways, there were schools, there was a university. But many of the institutions were very, very fragile. As time passed, government corruption grew. Gradually, the diamond industry was nationalized. The government brought in all kinds of shady characters. They brought in uh, American mafia. There were just an incredible range of very, very bad people involved in the, in the diamond business. Official diamond exports went from you know, to $300 million a year down to almost nothing. Pretty soon you had a uh, state in free fall. A lot of um, young students, university students, who were radicalized during this time and by this experience, and they, they formed a kind of an opposition that fed into the early days of the rebel movement that started up in the early 90s. One of the rebel leaders was former army corporal Fode Sanko. Fode Sanko, I know him very well. It's like a chameleon. Chameleon in the sense, a chameleon can take any color. The way he sees you is the way he appears to you. At times he looks nice, simple, loving. But Fode Sanko is very difficult to accept. And Fode Sanko cannot keep to his words. Today he is black, tomorrow he is white. No master! No slave. No slave! No master. nothing. You have to do it for yourself. Is that fair? Under Sanko's leadership, the RUF recruited and trained its army. Many people believe that the RUF actually had a genuine cause, a grievance against the government. The so-called legitimate government of Sierra Leone squandered the diamond revenues. They stole the money that should have gone for the development. No money was going back to build schools or hospitals. The infrastructure in Sierra Leone was atrocious. When they launched their civil war, their first objective was the lucrative diamond district of Kono. Sanko's rebel army brutalized all who stood in their way. The rebels insisted on having diamonds. When they discovered diamonds in Kono, they realized it was their only source of outside support. If those rebels were right here, doing farming, they would not have the outside support and the war would have been over a long time ago. I would not have had my hands amputated. By November 1993, more than 370,000 terrified citizens had become refugees. The RUF had achieved one of its objectives, to drive away much of the population from the diamond fields. The RUF wanted to take Kono or the diamond areas because of the resources. The rebels had captured the mines, but now they needed miners. A new campaign of terror was launched to turn Sierra Leone's diamond mines into slave labor camps. Before the start of the Civil War, Usman Conte was a typical teenager. But when he was just 17, he was abducted during a rebel raid on his hometown. We were in a motor car, in a truck, more than 100 of us. I thought that since we had been captured, they were going to kill us. They brought us here to suffer. They told us to mine. Thousands were forced to work at gunpoint, mining the diamonds that would support the RUF's war. It was day and night, day and night. They would kill us if you tried to rest. 
You'd have to go to the toilet, right there, where we worked. Physical exhaustion was very commonplace. In fact, it was a tactic of the RUF to wear out the miners so that they wouldn't be inclined to, to run away or flee. There wasn't enough food. We were slaves. If you decided to leave to find something to eat, and you are caught, you will be killed. Rebels hovered over each captive, guarding against escape or theft. If they suspect you, having a diamond, pray to God at that time that when they say, where is the diamond, you say, here is it. If not, you lose your life. So, that time they the hook. Sometime, when we were working, someone took a diamond and refused to give it back. They asked him for it, but he denied taking it. So he was interrogated, and when he insisted not taking it, he was shot and killed. He would now have to give it to them in the hereafter. Off the sweat of enslaved miners, rough diamonds poured in from the fields and were whisked out of the country along smuggling routes established decades before. The same routes had already been established to smuggle arms, to smuggle cocaine around West Africa. They could get uh, drugs, arms uh, or diamonds on any plane of their choice, any ship of their choice. And they were extremely resourceful and innovative in the ways they chose to do that. In return for the diamonds, we need arms and ammunition. Arms like AK-47 rifles, GPMG, that is a general purpose machine guns, RPGs. FN long barreled rifles, surface to air missiles, uh, helicopters, helicopter parts. Ammunition was often delivered in million block orders. RUF control of Sierra Leone's diamonds served another strategic purpose. When we get these rich areas, that is the resources area, then the government will collapse economically. It will not be able to finance its military. With the army starved of equipment and pay, many disgruntled soldiers turned against their own people. The soldiers were not really able to effectively prosecute the war. And uh, a lot of them became sobels, that is, soldier come rebels. And so that complicated the whole situation in the war front. As anarchy reigned in Sierra Leone, the country's children would soon be drawn into the conflict. Some were killed. Others did the killing. The conflict in Sierra Leone took on a horrifying new aspect when the RUF began kidnapping children. They would capture the children in a specific area and then drug the children, brainwash the children, they'd show them Rambo movies one after the other, fill them full of cocaine and marijuana and cheap liquor and say, your parents have betrayed you, they betrayed the country, they're your enemy, you've got to go and kill your parents. During the war, nearly 20,000 boys and girls aged mostly between 8 and 15 were turned into sex slaves or killing machines. They took me away and I was sexually abused. They gave me a gun but I didn't know how to use it so I just held on to it. Lovette Freeman was just 14 when she was abducted by the RUF. I did what they wanted me to do, because if I refused, they would threaten me with a knife. I did bad things. We went to a house to loot, and I was in front. They all waited in the back while I knocked on the door. A woman opened the door, and I pointed the gun at her. She staggered back and we entered the house. I took the woman's baby from the house and took her away with me. I abducted her. 
and he can't die now with Anne. So she so later sorry. died and I felt so sorry for that baby. By the end of 1994, with much of Sierra Leone in chaos, the government hired a South African mercenary army called Executive Outcomes to restore order. The soldiers for hire were promised diamonds as pay. Executive Outcomes had an effective air power which they used to their advantage in the diamond areas. They had one big aim to clear those areas of rebels because their whole pay depended on that. In just one month, executive outcomes drove the RUF out of most of the diamond-rich East. The resulting peace brought elections in 1996, but the RUF refused to participate. Former United Nations official Ahmad Tijan Kabar was elected president. Ahmad Tijan Kabar campaigned in a very simple way. They would help end the war and return this country to normalcy. Enough is enough. We should really try and stop the decline of our country. But at the urging of the UN, Kabar terminated the contract of executive outcomes. With no military force to stop them, the RUF rose up again. The RUF said that it was fighting against military rule and they were for democracy and they wanted peace and development. But when the military government left power and there was an elected government, they kept on fighting. And to punish those who voted for President Kabar, the RUF exacted horrific revenge on the people of Sierra Leone. They called us Tijan Kabar supporters. They said, today would be the last day you meddle in politics. They ordered me to stretch my hand. I pleaded with them in the name of God. I told them right now, I have my children, my husband is unemployed, and I am the head of my family. They mocked me saying, stretch your hand and touch God. Move your hand from the wall. Take off your hands out of the wall. That was the meaning of that topping of hands. Kumba Mbindi fled her village with her husband and young son when it was attacked by rebels. We left there and moved to Tumbudu. When we got there, they were still chasing us, so we stayed in the woods. At that time, I was four months pregnant. But the RUF caught up with them. Kumba's husband was dragged into the jungle, and three rebels accosted her. I pleaded with him, but he started undressing me. I was stripped and I fell. I continued to plead that I was pregnant, but he responded by saying that wasn't his doing. He went into the farmhouse, came out with a stick. I started bleeding. He was going to split my stomach open and remove my baby. Then Kumba's husband emerged from the jungle. Blood was spraying from his wrist area. He yelled. They cut my hands off. So I kept thinking. They cut my husband's hands off. They mutilated me. I asked him why they cut his hands off. He said they told him they did it because he voted for Tijan Kaba that it was lesson, so they wouldn't do that anymore. In 1996, the war entered its sixth year. Illicit diamonds had helped sustain a conflict that might otherwise have ended quickly. The amount of money that the RUF made from the diamonds in Sierra Leone is between 50 to 125 million dollars per annum during the time period that they had control over the diamond fields. The RUF were about to get more rich pickings. The army overthrew the president, 
and invited the rebels into Freetown as allies. Almost immediately, the RUF set about pillaging the capital in what they cynically called Operation Pay Yourself. We went house to house looting. We took belongings, demanded money, and sometimes killed two or three of their family members. It was a war of stealing, grabbing, and taking illegally what you never worked for. People were being forced into their houses. People, this was the time I had to go into hiding. You hear people being shot at. You hear people crying, rebels attacking them, women being brutalized. They were being raped in front of their children, in front of their husbands, in front of their family members. The free time was, was held, to put it very crudely. There was complete anarchy and instability in this country. The horror ended only when a Nigerian-led intervention force drove the RUF out of the capital. But by then, 6,000 people had perished. Corpses piled up outside Freetown's hospitals. The dead bodies that I saw, perhaps up to the day I die, I pray not to see that many dead people. And a once vibrant city was in ruins. Finally, the international community intervened. The warring parties met in Lome, Togo in July 1999 and signed a peace accord. It called for a complete cessation of hostilities uh, from all parties. It also granted amnesty to all the fighting forces, including the RUF. It also called for some power sharing. The Lome Peace Accord is probably one of the worst things that have been done in Africa in many, many, many years. To the horror of many in Sierra Leone, Fode Sanko, leader of the RUF, was handed the vice presidency. People said there will never be a military solution to this, there has to be a political solution. The political solution was to give the vice presidency of the country to a butcher. As vice president, Sanko was granted official oversight of Sierra Leone's diamond mines. The very objective he had sought through eight years of war. Halfway across the world, a Canadian pressure group called Partnership Africa Canada was working on peace building projects for Sierra Leone. And one of the Sierra Leoneans in the group said, this thing is really about diamonds. Until somebody does something about diamonds, this thing will never be over. We began to research the subject and sure enough, diamonds really were the heart of the matter. In January 2000, Partnership Africa Canada published a scathing report that exposed how diamonds funded the RUF's brutal war. The report also pointed the finger at De Beers. Although they'd closed their Sierra Leone office in 1985, the report claimed that De Beers were almost certainly purchasing Sierra Leone blood diamonds unwittingly after they'd been smuggled out of the country. you can't buy them in the country where they're mined, then you buy them somewhere else. In the end, they're all going to go into the same pot. So certainly they were buying diamonds that had been smuggled from a whole variety of places. De Beers itself did not buy any Sierra Leone diamonds from 1985 onwards, but clearly there were problems in terms of those diamonds from that country getting into certain channels, being smuggled and getting onto the international markets. <laughs> Most diamonds were smuggled out through neighboring country, Liberia. In a two-year period, over two billion dollars worth of diamonds had come into Antwerp, supposedly from Liberia. Yet none of these diamonds came from Liberia. Liberia itself has very few diamonds. 
This is a country that can't produce $10 million worth of diamonds a year. The report also showed that invoices were often falsified by listing a diamond shipment's last country of transport and not its country of origin. Many, many diamonds went through Swiss free ports, and so these were declared as Swiss diamonds. Switzerland, of course, doesn't have any diamonds. As negative press about blood diamonds spread, the industry took notice. De Beers was the first to act. De Beers began to recognize that this was a real issue, and as the industry leader, they would have to make some changes in the way they do business. They realized that they actually had to do something for whatever reasons, whether it was altruistic or whether it was to protect the good name of diamonds, they did become involved. In 2000, De Beers stopped buying diamonds on the open market, ending a practice that had been central to their business since the beginning. And basically said they would only buy diamonds from mines that they controlled or had a share in, so they knew exactly where the diamonds came from. When we look at the absolute tragedy that was going on in Sierra Leone. This shocked the world and it shocked the diamond industry. And we very quickly wanted to become part of the solution in putting an end to this. Diamond should have nothing to do with these kind of activities. For an industry that had altered very little in over a century, it was a dramatic change. The awareness of conflict diamonds is probably the biggest change to the diamond industry almost from the beginning. But just as the diamond industry finally took action, in Sierra Leone, the RUF rose again. The RUF rebels had broken the ceasefire and were on the rise once again. But this time, the world was determined to defeat them once and for all. In May 2000, a British intervention force landed on the shores of Sierra Leone. Together with UN troops, they crushed the RUF and arrested their leader, Fode Sanko. When Sierra Leoneans went freely to the polls, President Kabar was re-elected. Hundreds of citizens whose hands had been cut off to keep them from voting bravely cast their ballots. Today, we're happy that those flames of war have been extinguished and that now we are about to watch the flames of peace destroy some of the implements of war. But the peace in Sierra Leone is an uneasy one. Full amnesty was granted to RUF combatants. So war victims and the rebels who terrorized them are once again neighbors. And most of us consider the civil war as a long nightmare and people are prepared to forgive, not necessarily to forget, and to forge ahead in the hope that they will never experience this kind of atrocities again. The Sierra Leone Truth and Reconciliation Commission urges victims and perpetrators to find common ground. Killers are asked to offer remorse. Some people have died, some got lost. So all these people who, in one way or the other, fell victim of the war, we are to say sorry to them, and I extend my sympathy to them. Victims are asked to forgive. Not all can. I know we feel fine. It doesn't feel good. Sometimes I ask God to give me the power to meet the person who did this to me. We wouldn't be able to sit down like this and talk. For Kumba Mbindi, too, the torment of the war is ever present. We are still here and going through a lot of pain. We have suffered a great deal. The sexual assault she suffered at the hands of the RUF still casts a shadow over her life. 
My husband doesn't care for me anymore. He is gone and I'm here by myself. There is no other man here. Even those I go out with that want me, once they sleep with me and realize my condition, they walk away. But Kumba Mbindi will never have an opportunity to see her attackers brought to justice. Because very few RUF rebels will ever be prosecuted. Sierra Leone's UN-backed war crimes tribunal will deal only with those who bear the greatest responsibility for the war's worst atrocities. Fode Sanko was charged with crimes against humanity, but died in prison before he could be sentenced. But the verdict on blood diamonds is clear. Blood diamonds are the common thread that bound together this criminal enterprise. The rule of the gun reigns supreme. And the peace has changed little for those still toiling in the diamond mines. Usman Conte was kidnapped by the RUF during the war and forced to mine for diamonds. He's still mining. Without education or skills, it's the only work he can find. He remains a captive to diamonds. At this job, I haven't had anything yet. I am still trying. If I had another job, I could leave the mining job. But since I don't have another, I will stay here until God gives me something else. Some diggers receive a tiny share of what they find. Others earn a scant living. The mining conditions are awful. People dig in the hot sun all day long, often up to their waist in filthy water. There's no social cohesion. There's a lot of violence. These mining areas are great vectors for malaria, for HIV AIDS, for all kinds of uh, societal problems. A new project, the Diamond Development Initiative, seeks to deal with the issue of blood diamonds in a new way by shifting the balance of power back to the miners themselves. There are a million, if not a million and a half, artisanal alluvial diamond diggers earning a dollar a day. What we're suggesting with the Diamond Development Initiative, the DDI, is that uh, you need economic solutions to economic problems. But if you can get better prices for the diggers, if you can formalize this vast informal diamond economy, then you can bring peace and development to the diamond areas. There can be no future as long as the people that are, are working in these areas do not benefit. We believe that the communities, first of all, are the priority. Why is it that a diamond in Sierra Leone can be bought for $20 and then sold in Antwerp for $1,500? It's, it's perverse. What really needs to happen is for the diamond industry and for governments to actually start investing in their development, to start paying a decent wage to the people that are working there, but also a realistic price for the diamonds. Until that happens, Usman Conte and tens of thousands like him will continue to toil in Africa's diamond mines. But what of blood diamonds themselves? The diamond industry, governments and the UN have recently introduced the Kimberley process, an elaborate system of certification designed to eliminate the trade in blood diamonds once and for all. To date, more than 70 countries have signed up. I think one of the indications of success in the Kimberley process is what's happened in Sierra Leone. In 2002, I think Sierra Leone exported about $26 million worth of diamonds legally. In 2005, it exported $142 million legally. It's estimated that conflict diamonds have now been reduced to less than 1% of the world's diamond trade. 
but already there are cracks in the system. Illicit stones, mined by rebels in Ivory Coast, Liberia, and the Democratic Republic of the Congo, are still finding their way into the international diamond market. People who are trading conflict diamonds are taking them from conflict zones and bringing them into South Africa and then insinuating them into the South African system through the auctions in South Africa. And then once they appear in the auctions in South Africa, they are certified as legitimate diamonds. So you've got a real problem of policing what's going on in the so-called legitimate uh, diamond selling and diamond trading countries. The blood diamond story is not over. In regions as volatile as West and Central Africa, where poverty and political instability go hand in hand, a war funded by diamonds could easily be triggered once again. Next week, the surprising new evidence that reveals the true story of the Titanic's final moments. That's our true story next Tuesday at 8, here on 5.